Innovation, imagination, wonder. These are just some of the words used to describe Dr. Harvey Passes. Dr. Passes explores interesting people and ideas that will stimulate you. He questions the people who develop, create, and employ novel concepts in business and everyday lives. He especially loves to speak with successful people. How did they do it? How can you do it too? So let's join Dr. Harvey Passes in his quest of wonder and curiosity as we watch Dr. Harvey Passes Presents. There are trying times today. If you have a home or if you want to purchase a home, what are you going to do? Everybody seems to be running scared. They don't know how to handle it. Well, I listened and I heard you and I went out and I found some people who understand this and it is their profession, their occupation, their raison d'etre, you like that? Reason <laughs> for being, to make sure that your real estate transaction can work well for you. I invited these gentlemen to come down today to discuss all of this with us so we can learn and you could negotiate and navigate through the waters of real estate with a much finer, keener sense of what needs to be done today since the real estate market is really in a shambles. Isn't that true? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to it in a moment. So let me introduce to you two people. Now, there were supposed to be three. In a moment, I'll tell you about the third. But first, I'll bring to you Mr. Anthony Camisa. Anthony, thank Good. you very much for coming down. Thank you very much for having me, Dr. Passis. Uh, it's a pleasure. Anthony is an attorney at law, and he focuses his sublime, fantastic talents on real estate law, and we'll discuss with him all the legal aspects in buying and selling a home. And his practice, I think you're in Mineola. Mineola, New York. Mineola, right. Okay. And right next to you is no stranger to you because he's been on the show before, and that's Mr. Joseph DeVino of the Vine. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> welcome back. Thank you very much. Thanks for Great having me. Great to have you. And let me tell the folks a little bit at home about you to remind them again who you are because you haven't changed. No, no. <laughs> You're still who you are. Joe is a certified loan advisor. And uh, he's going to discuss all the financial information that's needed to buy your home, or basically any other kind of real estate transaction where finances are involved. He's an expert in this field at making sure that you can procure money. So we're going to discuss all that. These two gentlemen, actually, uh, there's a third gentleman who's not here. This third gentleman uh, with these two gentlemen, they travel around our region giving home buyer uh, seminars. So to help people get through these troubled times so they can get the home of their dreams or even sell the home of their dreams and, uh, and move on. And that gentleman who's not here today is a real estate broker, and that's Marshall Myers. Correct. And he's, he's a terrific, knowledgeable guy, but unfortunately, Marshall was ill, and he called me up just about two hours before the show. He was struggling to get here, but he couldn't. So uh, we, we say, get better, Marshall, and uh, we'll continue. Marshall's been in the business how many years? Um, about 15, 20 years. So between the three of you, you got about 31 years of accumulated experience to be able to offer information. Is that right? That is correct. correct. Okay. All right. So let's begin right now so we can uh, get right into the meat of what the show is all about. Okay. Anthony, why are you doing these seminars? Well, one of the, the main reasons we're doing the seminars is because of all the misinformation. Uh, many of the people out there are reading all the papers about the gloom and doom about the real estate market, yeah. or they're hearing information from their friends who are not inv currently involved in real estate. Right. So the purpose of our um, home buyers and sellers seminars are twofold. For the buyers, we're trying to give them as much information as possible so that we have a knowledgeable um, customer going forward so they know all the aspects that are involved in buying a home. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, especially with the collapse of the subprime market, people weren't being informed about the terms of their loan, um, about how much they were borrowing, about the adjustable rates. And that is part of the problem with the subprime market, and that's why people are having problems with adjustable rates now, is that people weren't given enough information. How could they not be given enough information? Do you, does, that mean, does, does that mean that, you know, educate me, does that mean that when they were going through the transaction, it was written on paper but no one explained it, or it wasn't even on paper? It basically came down to no one explaining it to them properly. So people, buy people were doing whatever they could to get into the homes. And then a lot of the subprime lenders were giving out loans 
to basically anyone who had oh. decent credit and just giving it to them, not telling them that in three years that their adjustable rate would go up and their monthly payments would go up by $1,000, $1,200. And for a normal working person who, who can afford that. So one of the things we try to do is educate them right. so, so they know every single step of the process so that when, they, when it comes time to buy a home, they have all the information possible. Now, for the seller's seminars, which we also do for people who are selling their homes, right. we encounter many people in Long Island and Queens who have owned their homes for 20, 30 years. They forgot about the whole process. They didn't. They don't remember how it was when they bought their house. Oh, but it was even different then. Oh, it was much different. Um, down payments were bigger. Sure. Um, used to hear about um, note burn, uh, mortgage burning parties after 30 years. That's would, exactly right. My, would, my parents did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You don't see that anymore. No one. They, the, the studies show that people plan on living their houses for seven, an average of seven years and then moving on to the next home. The other thing that people don't realize, one of the biggest things that I encounter all the time, is they don't understand that New York State charges transfer tax when they sell their homes. Okay. It's usually $2 per every $500 of the sales price. So for every $500 of the sales price, there's a $2 state tax. Okay, let's go back because we're we'll getting into details yes. that we're going to ask later on because this is important stuff. I'm going to just put down here so I don't forget to ask you about the details with taxes because that's, that's, that's important. Yes. But now, let's go back to the understanding of what's involved. Who are the players involved in a real estate transaction? Well, the players, it's usually a team effort. One of the things we stress to the people coming to the seminars, it's just not one person handling the transaction. Right. Usually the first person they're going to go to is the real estate agent. Mm -hmm. The real estate agent is going to help them find a proper home. So they can now they oh. find them that beautiful home. The home of their goes, dreams. Oh, I could see myself making pancakes here. And that they can afford <laughs> and that they could, and they'll enjoy the house. Once they actually see the house, you'll have it, um, an engineer. Which one of the things you need is an engineer report to make sure that the house is proper, the structure is proper, everything is working properly so that it can move forward in the house. Okay. Then you I have want to get into all that stuff later. Yeah. Then, you have a more, you. then you have a mortgage broker right? Okay. who's going to make sure that they have a pre-approval, um, that they're able to finance the purchase of their home. Right. Then you're gonna, going to have an appraiser who makes sure that the, the market value of the house is correct so that the bank can prop give them the proper loan because if a house is worth $700,000, um, and you're getting a loan for 500000 the bank's not going to give you a million-dollar loan. It's right. not going to happen. They want to make sure what the proper uh, to assure the bank what the proper value of the house is. Mm -hmm. Then you have the real estate attorney. You have a termite inspector. You have the title insurance company. So all of these players have to work as a team in order to successfully complete a real estate transaction. You know, I've, I've uh, bought and sold a number of homes over time, and it was amazing when I was younger. I would go into a room for a closing, all of a sudden, there's like a horde of people come in. Okay. Everybody's got their hand out. This one wants a tip. This one does this. <laughs> and the lawyer's just telling you, okay, put your pen in your hand and just start writing out the checks. And then you get writer's cramp at the end of the day, and you also have no more money left. And I never understood. No one explained to me well, that's who the these various people are and what their functions are. So this is good today. As a real estate attorney, that's one of the things that I try to do in almost every transaction is to let them know what their closing costs are going to be so that there's no surprises at the closing table. There's nothing worse than having someone at the closing table balk at signing the documents Absolutely. because they don't know what they're paying for. Absolutely. So that's one of the main purposes so people know what they're spending their money on. Okay, now what exactly is the state of the market in Nassau County right now? Joe. Well, I would tell you that, uh, depends who you ask. You know, there's a lot you. Of, there's a lot of, um, <laughs> there's a lot of media <laughs> out there who will tell you that uh, the market is still uh, declining. Uh, there were certain regions and states where the market's really still dropping down, and there's, but like New York, um, you know, we're pretty much hitting rock bottom. Uh, it's a great time to buy. The homes, uh, applications have picked up over the last month. And, uh, you know, we think that the, uh, the housing market may, may not jump 6 8% next year, but as long as we uh, are hidden close to the bottom, uh, we can only go up from here. Okay, hold on. You say New York. Do you mean Long Island? Tri-state. Do you say again? The, the tri-state mainly. You're saying the tri-state area. You're Absolutely. talking about New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Right. And you're saying that whole area as a region is, is bottomed. Well, we've seen more applications over the last month than we have, you know, than the last, oh. you know, six, seven months. So this is, uh, it really is a good time to make a purchase because uh, even if the housing market does go down, they're talking maybe another percent or so, and you're never gonna, you're never gonna hit, you're never gonna get the bottom, get the bottom price because you don't know when the time you buy, you know, the market's already come back up. Right. So if you could buy close to bottom. And with the uh, the rates being what they are, it's just you know it's a wonderful time. So right now is a really good time to be a buyer. It's a great time to buy. 
Great time to buy. That's important to know. That that's that's great. Okay. Now, when Joe, when someone has made the decision to purchase a home, what type of qualifications are you looking for? Well, if I get a phone call from a client, uh, I'm hoping that they're going to tell me they're putting 20% down. Now, hold on. Before you continue, just so that people at home remember, uh, I just want you to be aware that this gentleman now is in charge of making sure you can pay for it. He'll find you the money. Right. So now he's explaining how he's going to do that and what he's looking for, right? That's correct, yes. Please continue. Well, when, uh, when a borrower or a client calls up, we want to make sure the perfect borrower will have uh, at least 20% down. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that uh, the income could support the loan, uh, and basically in the debt that they're carrying. So uh, if you have uh, $100,000 in credit cards, uh, you have to make sure that on a monthly basis that you're able to pay for your, your monthly debts along with the new debt that's coming on in the mortgage. Right. I see. And the third important piece is we hope that we have a credit score of Okay. 700 plus. Okay, let's discuss this now. Don't don't get ahead of me here. Okay. The show's going to be over in three minutes. <laughs> we finished, and you guys are going to say, hey, I do. And they say, I don't know. Okay, let's go back. I want the details, because I know that my viewer at home is saying, well, what, what are your scores? What are you talking about? What is this, an SAT score? So hold on a second. We use the term called FICO, your FICO scores. We hear a lot about that, these FICO scores. What is F-I-C-O? What does FICO mean? And uh, and what does it stand for? Sure. Well, basically, it's, uh, it stands for a Fair Isaac uh, Credit Organization. And what it is is basically uh, it's a system where they, uh, the, the agencies, there's three uh, reporting bureaus, uh, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. Okay. Uh, anytime anybody opens up a new credit card, if they open up uh, um, a lease car, any sort, any sort of debt that they can have against them, these uh, reporting bureaus all report uh, and come up with a number. And, and they're basing this on... Uh, the likeliness of a person being late on a payment. And uh, what happens is uh, they're based on 30, 60, 90, or 100 days late. Mm -hmm. So they are basically reporting if you're a good payer or a bad payer. And based upon um, those uh, criteria mm -hmm. on how late or how good, pay, uh, good payer that you are, mm -hmm. it'll give you a score. Uh, and the score ranges from 350 to 850. 350 being the bad end and 850 being you know the great Sublime. end. Sublime. Right. Yeah. And uh, nobody nobody has an 850 score. Nobody has a 350 score. Right. Because there's a lot that makes up the uh, the actual number itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it could go as far as uh, the amount of credit cards you have, uh, the types of credit cards that you have. Uh, there are good credit cards to have, bad credit cards to have. Um, and uh, basically, once you have a score, that'll enable us to determine uh, what type of strong borrower we have. All right, so now that explains that. What what kind of things can impact the score? You, you basically said if you just don't pay your bills? Or, yeah, that's, mean, that's one. The, the entire reason for the FICO scores to being out there is the likeliness of somebody being late on payments. That's why they created this system. So if, um, if you, you, technically you're supposed to have no more than five credit cards. And those credit oh, cards... I didn't know this. Yeah. Oh. And those credit cards better be Visa, MasterCard, Amex, or one of the big time players. It hurts your score to have like department store credit cards. Oh, you see, you're, you're, you're uh, educating me. I didn't know this. So those those credit, those department store things really are useless. They, they actually scores. hurt your credit score because they've taken on a platform on, a, on surveys. They say, who's likely to be late on payments? And they decided that through the survey, people who don't have credit cards, as Visa, MasterCards, people have department store credit cards, tend to be late on payments and tend to go into bankruptcy. So having really? these cards are traditionally just bad for your score in general. Oh, so it's a good idea to get rid of those dumb cards. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, sure. when you walk in, they say you buy it today, you get a 10% off your purchase and get, sign them for our credit right. card. But even oh. even bigger than that is uh, if you go to CVS, or if you open up just any uh, yeah, charge no names, card, no whatever, yeah, whatever, right, whatever right. it might be. So if you open up one of these uh, department store cards, um, another big part of your credit score is the length of history. So if you have, and then they base it on a, a 20 years. So if you have one credit card for 20 years, you've maximized the amount of credit score that you could go up in that particular field. So if uh, you open up another credit card, mm -hmm. now your length of history is 10 years. They take the length of time divided by two, mm -hmm. and they say that now you have a uh, smaller length. So your score is going to decline a little bit based on that alone. Mm -hmm. So if you've gone from excellent credit, just by opening up another credit card, it could... It can oh, lower wow. your score. I yeah. already know some of the things I've got to do. I've got to get rid of these some cards right. that I just don't use. Right. Well, yes. I don't use them. 
Yeah, you know, they're like like these little dinky stores. Sure. That makes no sense. That's great. I'm, that's why I love doing these shows. I, I learn all this, all this. Okay. So you you aside from this now, is there another way to uh, to establish good credit? Yeah. Pay uh, bills. The, well, the, that's that's the main key. Um, it's hard to get a credit card if you're if you're a student. Um, sometimes uh -huh. you know, sometimes just starting credit is difficult. One of the best ways to do it is if you have a, a if you're young and if you have yeah. a parent who has a credit card, you could add your uh, son or a daughter to your account. So now let's just say uh, you go to your mother and say, Ma, listen, I need a credit card. Would you please help me out? She'll put your name on her account, and if she had that credit card for 20 years, instantly you get the same 20 years credit, oh. and that helps you build up uh, credit as well. So once you have one card, it's easier to to keep getting additional cards, but don't go past that five card range. This is right back in trouble. Okay, so it's five cards. That's great. Uh, this is good to learn all this stuff. Uh, what if if someone had a uh, personal bankruptcy? Uh, would this stop them from being able to buy a home? Bankruptcies are tough because they stay on your credit report for about seven, eight years. Mm. Um, however, uh, you if you're in bankruptcy, you have to have after it's dismissed after two years. That's the guideline that the banks use in order to... How many years? Two years. Mm -hmm. After two years, the banks will kind of sweep it under the carpet, so to speak, and then they'll, uh, they'll give you a mortgage based upon your income uh, you know, and your down payment as well. But within, within that two-year time, it's very difficult to get a loan. You have to kind of... Time heals wounds right. with a, a bankruptcy. Okay. Let's, let's move on now because uh, time's really going. And half the show's over already. I've got so much more to ask you. Okay. This is going to be for you now, Anthony. So somebody wants to buy a home. Where's the first place they go? Well, one of the first things I tell people is they need a real estate broker who is reputable mm -hmm. and who can show you their past results. Um, every During the real estate boom of the past five, six years prior to the subprime collapse, mm -hmm. um, it seemed like everybody and their mother was a real estate broker mm -hmm. because they got their True. license. True. And I think that um, the Board of Realtors stated that most – most of the realtors sold, like more than 50 to 60 percent of the realtors in their organization only sold one home <laughs> over the like in the year 2006. So these were people that were not doing it full time. That's why you have to make sure: does your realtor do this full time? Is this their primary source of income? This is good information. And then what are their past results? What have they so What have they helped people buy? And what have they sold? If you go to someone for a presentation for a real estate broker and this is their first deal, do you really want to be dealing with that person or do you want to be dealing with the person who sold 20 homes or help people buy 20 homes? So that's one of the things. And the other thing, too, is you have to have a comfort factor. You have to have a sort of trust factor with your broker because mm -hmm. they're going to be helping you to buy a the right home, the home of your dreams. So you have to make sure you have a certain comfort level that you're able to have a conversation with them about your what you're looking for and you're able to communicate with them about what you're looking for in a home. Now the buyer also has to be aware of the fact under most circumstances the real estate broker really represents the seller. Yes, because most of the time when a listing broker, that's the person who represents the seller, signs up for a certain commission, either 4 to 6 percent, right. they have to offer a certain percentage out to other brokers, so there's incentive for other brokers to show that particular house. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes people see an ad in the paper, and they'll go directly to the broker, and that broker is basically representing the seller but trying to get the purchaser to buy the home. That's why a lot of times people will get their own broker to go out and look for them so that they're representing their interest. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very interesting. People learning all this stuff. <laughs> yes. Okay, Joe, here's a term that I've heard, and I, I need you to explain it. What does it mean, the law of agency? Well, that's kind of going back to what Anthony was talking about just a short while ago. Um, brokers, it's very important. Most people, when they're going out buying, shopping for a home, you notice that uh, you know the realtor tends to be uh, friendly to you, which they ought to be because they're trying to sell a home. Mm -hmm. But when you represent the seller, they, they need to disclose that, that they're working for the seller. But um, when you're going out shopping, if you tell your the agent, who's not representing you, representing the seller, that uh, I'm willing to spend maybe $450,000 on this home. Mm. Well, they have a responsibility mm. to tell the, uh, the, the, home, the, home buyer, the home seller. Seller. Because, you know, they work for them. So you got to watch out in this scenario on what you say and what you don't say. you got to always remember that a realtor, if they're not a buyer's broker, they represent the seller. Okay. Let's take a moment, and then we're going to move on. When you say a buyer's broker... How do you get someone to be 
you're a buyer. How do you get someone to be your broker? Do you walk into an agency and you see an agency that says, that says oh, that's, the, that's a good agency. Go to XYZ agency. They're terrific. Then you go in there, you meet some guys, friendly, shakes your hand and everything else. You say, listen, I'd like you to represent my interest. What do you do? I don't understand. Do you pay him for that? Or does that come out of the sale? And does he truly become your representative and not the seller's? It's a little unclear you're paying to me. Say, well, if you, anytime you have a lease, if you're renting a place, and anybody who has rented before, yeah. they, the person renting the apartment is the, always pays the broker. So if I'm looking for an apartment, I find this apartment, I usually have to pay my first month's um, rent and security and also pay a percentage to the broker. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're renting, so that's almost the same concept with the buyer's broker. Because he's paying, paying the by you. I'm paying, I'm paying him. Right. I'm paying the broker to find me the home that I'm looking for. Right. And that is different. It, a lot of it's a lot of real here. yeah, a lot of real real estate um, companies were not doing it. Now they're starting to do it because of the fact that they are going out there aggressively looking for you because they're being paid by you. And on the other circumstances, they were being paid by the whatever the seller, the listing broker right. was offering out. This right. time, you're affirmatively paying this person a certain percentage to go and look for a home for but you. But that's with renting. What about they're doing this with home? home buying now. So then I, I still don't understand. If I say to you, if I walk in to uh, Mr. Brokey, as a marshal is here, as a marshal, I want you to represent me. What is he going to say? Fine. Is he going to tell me here's what my fee is, or is he, or is he going to say I get a piece of that, or how does he get no, paid? No, it's usually like a one one percent or two percent of whatever the sales price is, and they'll go out there aggressively looking for the home. You're going to tell them how much you, you're willing to spend, and they're going to go out and aggressively look for you. So he'll get 1% or so from the home, and then on top of that, the other broker, I mean, where, am I going to write out a check to him at closing? No, or the other broker. going to come out of the sale? The other broker's being paid out of the proceeds from the sale. I see. Yes. Okay. And that's why a lot of um, real estate companies now are sending their brokers back for education classes on doing buyer's broker because they're becoming more and more popular. Okay. This is for you now. So I found the home of my dreams. As I said earlier, I'm going to be making pancakes here. It's going to be exciting. Best pancakes you ever had. Well, how do I go about now? The whole process, making an offer, and what what happens? What's okay. the whole? Stuff? Well, once because I'm not going to speak to the yeah. to the seller. Well, through your agent, you're going to present an offer to the seller. So I'm going to tell Ma Marshall, Marshall, I'm going to pay for this house 450. Okay. The seller agrees. You enter into a binder. Go ahead. Now the binder really does not hold much weight. It's oh. now you enter into a contract of sale. The seller's attorney will. Excuse me. When you do a binder, is there any money passed? Um, usually, when I see a hundred dollars. Oh, $100. But that's something that the buyer can walk away from. So I, I tell people the binder really does not mean much. I said the first thing you want to do is enter into a contract of sale. Okay. Now, when you enter into a contract of sale, what happens is the seller's attorney will prepare four original contracts mm -hmm. with, the t um, with the terms of the deal, how mm -hmm. much it's going to cost. Um, usually they'll have a mortgage contingency, what the down payment is, when you're going to close, anything um, that you've agreed upon as far as repairs to the home. The seller's attorney will forward the four original contracts to the purchaser's attorney. Mm -hmm. The purchaser will meet with their attorney and go over the terms of the contract, mm -hmm. present it with the down payment usually made to the seller's attorney as attorneys to deposit in their escrow account. Okay. Now, those four contracts are sent back to the seller's attorney. The seller's attorney <laughs> will meet with his seller to go over the terms of the contract. Then they will s sign all four original contracts. The seller's attorney will then deposit the um, down payment check into his attorney escrow account, keep two originals for his office, usually one to his client, one for his office. Forward the other two to the purchaser's attorney, so that the one original to the purchaser, one for his office. Right. And then you're officially in contract of sale. Uh -huh. Now, once you're at that stage, um, a standard New York State contract has a mortgage contingency that's set in the contract. That's built into it. It's built into the contract. So most most, most contracts, yeah. So if you have a $450,000 sales price and you're getting a mortgage for $400,000, right. usually as a sales attorney I'll put in there, it's contingent on the borrower obtaining a mortgage for $400,000. Within a certain time? Within, yes. You, the standard time is 30 to 60 days. Mm. Okay, if I represent the seller, I want it 30 days because I want to know if the borrower is getting a, a loan. If I represent the buyer, 60. I want 60 days. Right. So during that time period, at any time, if there's a mortgage denial issued by the prospective purchaser's lender, then the purchaser's attorney can forward that denial to the seller's attorney, and that down payment is released, the contract is canceled, with no obligations to either party. Oh, so that, that's good. But if everything goes through, everything goes good. and at the that's last minute somebody says, you know, I don't want to sell or I don't want to buy, <laughs> 
then then you, you could have possible litigation in regards to the default of the contract. But what I tell people at these seminars is, as a purchaser's attorney, my first like Obligation. concern yeah. during the first half of the contract until you receive a commitment letter is to protect your down payment. Right. If you're putting down, uh, say, a four hundred thousand right, dollar home, right, right. and you're putting down that 40, type of, you put eighty thousand, you have twenty percent, right. you're putting eighty thousand. Oh, yeah. right. I'm trying to protect your eighty thousand. That's my sole goal. Right. Okay, because during that time, from the time you enter the contract to the time we get a mortgage contingency, you're dealing with your mortgage broker, you're submitting W twos, you're going through your bank accounts to make sure you're getting a mortgage contingency. So I'm trying to protect that down payment. Once we get that commitment letter, then I'm seeking to help you close the transaction, get you to the closing table so that you could, you're able to purchase the home. Okay, hold it right there. We've got about three minutes left. Okay. We've got a, a couple more things. I want quick answers now. Yes. Okay. First, do you recommend that they get a home inspection? In almost every single case. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, should the person, how do you know that you're getting someone who will be doing a good job? Is there any things you can look for with home inspection? Well, you want to make Refances. sure, one, that they're licensed, licensed and, and reputable, and they have a track history. Usually, are they certified? Is there a certification? There's a license. A license. license, yes. Not a certification. Get a referral as well. Okay. Uh, next, what is a title report, and what is it going to show you? A title report, basically, when you, enter, when you purchase a home, you're getting a deed from the seller. One of the, per the main purpose of title insurance is meaning that you're getting a clean title, meaning that there's no liens or encumbrances against the title. The number one lien against any home is usually the seller's mortgage. So you want to make sure that the mor their mortgage is paid off. You want to make sure that all of their judgments, tax liens, child support judgments are paid off because the title insurance company is giving you title insurance that you are getting good and clean title mm -hmm. and that there's no other liens about, except for the current mortgage you're using to purchase the so home. Which will be and then if there's ever off. any claims against the home after this time, you can present the title insurance, and they indemnify you if there's any claims made against the, the property. Okay, that, that's important for people to understand. Yes. What kind of disclosures are usually uh, mentioned at the time of purchase or buy? Well, New York State has a form that you're able to fill out at closing. It's usually a two-page form where the seller discloses any knowledge of any of the defects in the home. There's a leak in the basement. The yes. The has this. Yes. And... So what happens is New York State has a two-page form that the seller must fill out. However, in lieu of completing that form, the seller can just give the purchaser a $500 credit at closing. In almost 100% of the transactions where I represent a seller, I tell them to give the $500 credit. Right. Because if you knew of something and you did not disclose it on that form, Whoa. they could come back to you after the closing to return. There's no statute. There's no statute. Okay. And it's up to the seller, not the buyer. The for that seller, yeah, yes. Rule. And the seller, every time I represent a seller, they're giving the $500 credit. Right. And also, there's a lead, lead paint disclosure, which is part of every contract. House is born, I think it was that 1978. Whatever, whatever yeah. You have to disclose whether there's any lead paint or you know of any, and you provide a pamphlet to the purchaser. Okay. We're out of time. Will you guys come back? Yes, sure. we will. Because sure. there's plenty more to talk about. I know we really. <laughs> <laughs> rattled right through this thing. I think we got a lot of good information. This was absolutely terrific. I appreciated it. Anthony Camisa, attorney at law. Thank you very Real much. Real estate Doc. extraordinaire. Thank you very much, Dr. Excellent. Passos. You gave great information. I really appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to come down. Joe Davino, terrific. Uh, money lender extraordinaire. Okay. <laughs> Able to uh, really explain to us all of the labyrinthian. Uh, corridors of trying to you sell and then buy your home and, and make it work out well in this, this terrible economy. But this was really great. I appreciated it. And in 15 seconds, any last words to telling my viewer at home right now? Should they buy? Should they sit and they wait today? It's a great time to buy. When you buy today, you could uh, just guarantee equity in your home from the years to come. Okay. I think buying is one of the best things you could ever do. I say don't listen to people who say you should rent. I, th I always say renting is throwing away money. Mm -hmm. You're not building equity. Terrific. I happen to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I agree with you. No question about it. Okay, so I hope you got all the information out of it that you needed and that you understand what you've got to do in today's crazy world of real estate and that things really aren't as bad as you think they are. Just go ahead and you see something you like. Money is good right now. Things are good right now. Go ahead and take advantage of it. The prices are low. Okay, Dr. Pass is saying right now, so long for now. Got to go. See you again next time. Put it there. Great. Thanks, Doc. Great information. Thank you very much.